Chris is, Chris, is, Chris is right. I'm not wearing a big, thick jumper today because you had me absolutely bead him yesterday. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Okay, I've just walked around that because I was looking for this. Right. Okay, this probably isn't going to work again, but we'll see how we go. So, yesterday was, you know, what did we know? And, and I, was, I was talking to some people at lunchtime today. You know, it would be really great if... I don't know how many of you are doing this. Is anyone sort of writing a journal or keeping track of what, how it's going or any of that kind of... Yeah, a couple. It would be really great. I know it sounds like a really naff thing to do. Not necessarily journal like Dear Diary, but it would be really great if you could write down what you know, what you did know, what you're learning, and so, so that at the end of ISS you've kind of got a feel of how much you've learned, and also so that you can then write this up and send it to us. Send it to... Where is she? There you are. Um, Lynn, or to myself, um, if you've got any stories or anything, but just for, your, for yourselves as well, because you kind of are getting information avalanche here and it's great to figure out what you've been going through here so um, you know I had something here I'm a bit distracted the reason why I didn't answer to Chris is because as you probably noticed yes, yesterday I had a really well designed lecture and you guys just threw me totally off tack so today I don't have a well designed lecture and you're probably going to expect one but what I do have is some of these I have a question for you. Shh. I'm going to take the ball straight back. If you don't. I need two scribes. I need two scribes. Sorry. So uh, I've got a question for you. How, what, what percentage of the Earth's surface do you think is covered in ocean? Oh, you all know. Okay, great. Now, how would you, how would you test that, given the, the, the tools that I've just given you? Sorry, put your hands up. You can't just... Yeah. You'd, you'd use satellites and do it visually. Yeah. You'd use a satellite on a blown up ball of a... <laughs> But that's a good idea. No, no, that's a good idea. Yeah? yeah. Measure the surface area. Measure the surface area. So what you'd, what would you, how would you do that? Derive a formula for the surface area of a blown up ball. Okay. You're all getting a bit too clever for me. What would you do? Estimate, how would you do that? Well, pass to the ball, throw the ball up to her. The person who's speaking gets to hold the ball. There you go. So you just estimate it by looking at it. Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, okay. Do you know that it's a, good, it's a good place to begin? It's a good place where scientists will begin. They'll look at this thing and go, well, you know, I can see that there's more blue than there is green and yellow and pink so that oh there's a you're really desperate to speak okay that one I'm, I'm learning oh okay I'm learning to repeat quite what people are saying because I was told off yesterday for not doing this no no I'm doing so this this idea was to take the ball to deflate it to cut it up to cut up the blue bits and the other bits and then weigh the difference no just look at the difference Okay, anyone else? Yeah, anyone else? Oh, 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 stripey top, your arm is going to just break. What? So throw the ball, take the ball up. Now show me what you mean. Oh, that nearly hit the camera. Dro trace the land onto a piece of paper. Okay, Trace, do you know, you, can I just say, you guys were so good at questions yesterday, you've been utterly rubbish on this one. <laughs> Has anyone else got an idea of, yeah, okay. Well, if you, it's sort of split into these little segments. Split into segments? I'm just repeating for the mic thing, yeah? Okay, so if you sort of, if you counted how much, or you looked at how much was in each thing, you did an average of it, and then time it by how many you know, seconds it was around. That's so weird. <laughs> So you cut it into segments, and then you, okay, okay, you know, I'm going to take two more, and then I'm going to, no, no, first I'm going to tell you the tools that I have here. I have 240 students and four blown up earth-shaped balls, okay? We're, we're not, we're just, let's work with what we've got. Yeah, you've already spoken, haven't you? Let's have somebody else. Somebody else, throw the ball down over here. Me? Oh, watch the camera. <laughs> yep. Oh. 
Okay, okay, okay. Okay, what about, let's, let's think a bit more naturally. What, what, what about probability? Probability. Let's think along. Oh, there's a few hands that have gone up here. Blue shirt. No, no, behind you. You're wearing a grey shirt. Yeah. I think he's going to get it. Put a random dot on the globe. Yeah, and do that continuously. And do that continuously. Over and over. Then you might be able to estimate or calculate the surface area. Oh, based on probabilities of the random. Oh, oh, something. We need a random dot on a balloon. Okay, sorry, first with the camera's going like this. Okay, there's one at the back here. No, you, you with the green thing and the black shirt, yeah. Yes, yes, gentlemen. Oh, well, I didn't realize that. Fair point, fair point. So, um, well, the middle, a bit less complicated and more fun is that we throw this around, right? And you, when you catch it, you see if your thumb landed on water or on land. And we do this about uh, several hundred times. <laughs> I've got to say, I've got to say, of all the solutions that have come up so far, that's the first one we can do, right? That's the first one we can actually do. Okay, so instead of, instead of doing it several hundred times, why don't we have one, you have land, you write ocean on yours, and if you, we have to be really quiet for this to work, because normally you do this with one ball, but there's quite a few of you. So, what's the story? I'm, I'm using the experiment that you've designed here. You catch the ball. And if your thumb, okay, left thumb. So when you catch the ball, because that's about as random as you can get, look what is under your left thumb. And if it's ocean or if it's land, you shout it out. And you, everyone else, if you're not holding the ball, you have to be completely quiet. Okay, purple top, yes. Uh, what happens if you're on a coastline, so it's half <laughs> Can someone please put their thumb on it and tell me if you think that's likely to happen? You know, just put your thumb randomly anywhere on the globe on a coaster. Ah, it is. Oh, dear. Stripey top again. You're desperate to speak. You could do what, sorry? You could draw equal squares. I'm going back to the throwing one. You know, this wasn't meant to take the whole hour and a half here. Let's just try this. We're going to do this literally. It's five past now. We're going to do it for two minutes, no more. And everyone has to be quiet. I know, put your hands down. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> We just get, oh, it's a question. Sorry, yeah, another okay. idea. Like, what if you land on a time bar? Because well, that's... that's <laughs> and that's more long. Is Antarctica land or ocean? Land. Okay, we've made a vote. We've made a vote. It's land. Great. And if the Arctic's ocean? I take your point, though. It's water. I should say seawater. What we're doing is we're seeing how much of the ocean is covered in, how much of the earth is covered in ocean. How's that as a redefinition? Have you got a question? What yeah. Okay, we're talking ocean. We're talking ocean. You guys ask too many questions and don't do enough experiments. You don't understand the fun of science here. Stop throwing the ball. Everyone else quiet. Shh. Shh. Okay, ball. Throw it. I was just going to say, we just do just in front of our thumb, so that's a tiny point. Perfect. Okay, just in front of your left thumb. Go. <laughs> Water, ocean. Okay, shh. Stop a minute. If you if if you're not holding if you're not holding the ball, don't speak.
stop. Your two minutes is up. Great. What have we got? Can you count them up? Write, can you write it next to it? 16, 36. Who can do percentages? Total is? Okay. What percentage have you come up with? It's in the 70-ish percent, isn't it? Okay. Has anybody got a number? You've all got... Sorry? 70%. Okay, great. 69%. That's not bad, is it? Okay. Thank you, Scribes. Well done, everyone. So, I mean, you get the point. There's an awful lot. It's, it was a silly experiment, maybe, but... But if you get the experiment right, you can find out an awful lot, even if you already think you know the answer. I'm going to have the same dilemma I had yesterday. Now, today, I thought I might... I was thinking that you've heard a lot about Antarctica, an awful lot about Antarctica, and part of the reason for that is because both Victoria and I have spent a lot of time there, and we love it very much. But the International Polar Year, as you know, is also about the Arctic, so I thought I'd spend some time talking about the Arctic. You've also heard a lot about fish, so I thought I wouldn't talk about fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. As I said yesterday, whoever it was who asked that question, who said, why didn't you talk about your research area? Why did you do big picture? It's because I did say very honestly, you know, fish biology might not be your thing, but upper astrophysics might be. What I'm showing you here, I just want to, I'm going to go back again. What I'm showing you here, because I think it's important that you know this, is is Arctic sea ice extent over the last 20 years. Let me see if I can go back. Over the last... Okay. No? Okay, is it going to go? Over the last 28 years, the purple line shows you the, the mean, the average... Um, hello. The average sea ice extent over the last 28 years. And you can see, because you know, sea ice changes, it's a natural system, it goes over that line, it goes under that line. That's what happens. That's the definition of average. From about the year 2000 onwards, as you can see at the top, the ice has been consistently less than that average. Did you all see that? Do you need to see that again? You, you saw that changing? So it looks from these images, and satellite imagery was one of the things that was mentioned earlier, about ways we can look at the Earth, is that the sea ice is reducing. We can also maybe add some... Um, okay, this isn't much fun. Let's try the other clicker. We did this yesterday, didn't I? Okay, I'm just going to stand over here. Oh, yeah! Woo! There we go. Don't know which one did that. <laughs> so, what you've got here is, is sea ice extent over the last 30 odd years. Zero is the average, and you can see that it goes down. How does that look? What does it look like it's doing? How would you kind of define how it's dropping? Sorry, put, put your hands up. Going, going down reasonably linearly. First it oscillates and then it goes. So what we're seeing is we're seeing, we're seeing a kind of uppy downy bit on top of a general overly downy bit, right? Yes, we're going to be really scientific about this. So somebody said linear. Oh, I'm not really having a good time here. Let's try this one. Here we go. Here would be a linear line going through that data. You've got about an 8% decrease per decade. That means by the end of this century, there could be no sea ice in the, in the Arctic in September. Another way you could look at it, though, is that there's a tipping point that's been reached. And that means that it's now reduced, going down at a much faster rate. And the latest studies suggest that the Arctic sea ice might be, uh, that it might be ice-free in September or in the summer in as soon as 30 or 40 years' time. So that's in our lifetimes. We're seeing change happening in our lifetimes. And we don't know. We don't know. We don't understand all the processes that are happening. Someone yesterday was talking about polar bears. I kind of put together today's talk based on things that you shouted out yesterday of things that you might want to know more about. So we can move around a bit. But you did mention uh, polar bears, possible extinction. What's going to happen if the sea ice melts what ha you know i think most people understand this idea that the polar bears need sea ice in order to get around they're going to need to swim for longer distances 
their existence is under threat by reducing sea ice. I think it's reasonable to say that. And there's a big IPY project looking at polar bear health and looking at polar bears. Um, people, people's lives are also being affected by reduction in sea ice, by changes in the Arctic. Let's, do you remember we also talked about health yesterday? I thought I'd just show you this, this graph of... This is showing... This is also in your book. This is showing how atmospheric... A lot of atmospheric and ocean circulation drives and ends up in the Arctic. This is sort of just the nature of the global circulation system. And as a result, we end up bringing a lot of chemicals to the Arctic that are not originally from the Arctic. Sorry about this. Um, and you don't, you're not meant to be able to see the detail on this. This is just showing you that there are elevated levels of pollutants and chemicals in Arctic species like cod, seal, polar bear, uh, the, the things which people who live in the Arctic eat and hunt. And so that's getting into the whole food system. There's a big study happening on, on health and food. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just going to try and change the clicker over here, see if I, how I get on with this one. I'm just going to stand next to the computer. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Which one was it? It does it every time. So looking back at the Arctic, looking at sea ice, the, the white, this, we're looking at the Arctic. I know, so I'm so used to looking at this that I forget. This isn't a normal way of looking at the Earth necessarily. What we've got here, we've got Greenland and Canada and, and you can see the Scandinavia and Russia coming around this side here. And that white is the observed sea ice uh, in September 2002. And the gray is projected sea ice in 2070. That is according to the Arctic Climate Impact assessment, assessment. That's if there's a linear decrease. So that's not on the tipping point theory. And <coughs> we'll wait and see. It's just when I walk near it. There we go. These are the current shipping routes that people use to get from Asia through to Europe and the east coast of the US. The Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage. I think you can see fairly clearly if the sea ice reduces, that's going to open up a whole new lot of shipping routes. And in addition, we touched on yesterday, there's an awful lot of hydrocarbons, a lot of oil reserves, gas reserves in the Arctic, and that's going to get... Um, become more easily accessible if sea ice melts. I'm, I'm just going to stand here because I'm struggling a bit with my clicker. Um, so these are some of the big economic questions and political questions which are, and which are going to become apparent in the, in the Arctic due to potential climate change. Remember that photo that we just saw of the woman, the, the reindeer herder? This is where the reindeer herders live. These are the different sets of people. And you can see... This chart also shows you in the red and the orange and the yellow, that's the, that's the areas which are going to change in terms of temperature the most over the next 30 years. And you can see that the reindeer herders live in those areas, and that's affecting how the reindeer exist as well. So, because I did say we'd move away from Antarctica and fish, I thought I'd talk to you a little bit, show you a little animation about reindeer and reindeer herding. What, um, what this animation shows you is two tribes of reindeer. Now, just so you know, reindeer and caribou, it's the same thing. It's just got a different name depending on where it is in the world. And the, the sort of overarching name for that is rangifer. The blue is the porcupine herd. The brown is the central Arctic herd. And you can see we're in a, a large, large area of land here between Alaska and northern Canada. And you can, you can see we're going through the months. So we're in May now. We're about to go into June. And around this time of year, the two herds which generally stay apart are coming together for their annual caribou conference and a little, little bit of genetic mixing perhaps and then they're heading back to where they came from but they generally stay fairly separate but that meeting is quite important in terms of making sure that there's a, a certain amount of new genetic variability in their system and um, then they go back and, and bring up their young in separate areas this data has been collected over 10 years. Who's got an idea of how you might collect that kind of data? Stripey top. Electronic tagging. These days, you put a GPS tag on a reindeer, and it, you know always where it is because you've got satellites.
This date is 10 years old. You couldn't do that 10 years ago. What do you think you did 10 years ago? Ooh, yeah, I don't think I've heard from you yet. You asked the reindeer herders. Yep, that's a really good one. And there's a, there's a lot of projects in IPY are working directly with reindeer herders because you're quite right. It's, it's a, you know, they know where the reindeer are. Use some statistics? Yeah. Statistics? Mm, I'm not sure they'd actually tell you where the reindeer are because we don't know. But what they did, oh, I'll take one more. Yeah, red hairband. Following the rain. Well, do you know what? You're not far off. They didn't exactly follow them around. What they did is not far off, and we use GPS tags today. They use radio collars. They'd put a radio collar on them, and then these guys would go out. And this is a huge amount of land. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Canada and Alaska. It's an enormous size. And, and people would go out. They'd have a radio collar on the reindeer, and they'd go out with these detectors and just go walking all day long and try and detect a radio signal. And the strength of that signal told you how many reindeer were in the area. This means that we have a 10-year record of where reindeer have been, where they've gone, and then we can also use this to figure out how their migration is changing, how it might be affected by climate change, by habitat change. A large amount of IPY, the, the message I'm trying to bring home here isn't just about what reindeer do, but it's about the importance of doing long-term monitoring and, and collecting data. You don't necessarily know what it's going to be useful for. It's just something that's interesting. Now, do you remember where, you remember where they had their caribou conference? A few years ago... Um, the U.S. government was wanting to build, to drill uh, for a lot of oil in the Arctic. I don't know if any of you were, followed that story, and there was going to be a big pipeline going across Alaska. That that drilling was going to happen right where that caribou conference happens. That was where they were going to set up an oil rig, where they were going to have all the, the pipes coming in and out. And again, without data like this, the scientific community wouldn't have even been able to respond to say, well, these are the risks that you are running by drilling in this area. So, so a, lot of, a lot of science and science to do with the Earth system. See, I, I guess I'm making this point because a lot of people say to me, like someone at lunch said to me, so those molecules you're measuring in Antarctica, you know, what's the point? Like, what, what's, what's going to come out of it? What's the, and I, I said, well, you know, I don't know. You know, those molecules had never been measured before. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, people might go, ah, oh, you know, it's really great that we know that there's OIO in Antarctica because blah, blah. I don't know what reason. It was just interesting to find it. Anyway, I, people do live in the Arctic and uh, have for a very, very long time. I just thought that you might take a moment to, to, uh, to talk amongst yourselves and ask what key questions are being asked by researchers in the Arctic regarding people. So we're talking physical science, we're talking social science. It's, it's all related, remember? And how would you investigate this? So think of a key question, and then, then how would you actually go about trying to investigate that? And again, I'm just going to give you five minutes, because I remember what happened when I gave you 15 minutes yesterday. So talk to the people in your area, and have a little, have a little go there. <laughs> all right. How are you? All right, okay, can I have a couple of scribes, please? Scribes, hello, chalk writers, can I have a couple of scribes? That's great. Uh, you know what's really nice? I just saw a whole bunch of you who've got, who've got the balls there looking at the Arctic and kind of talking about that, which is actually a really good point. You know, feel free to pass these around, because actually looking at, we don't actually think about the world in terms of the Arctic very often. So, you know, I haven't shown you that many maps, and you might... Just feel free, don't throw it around aggressively, but feel, just pass the ball around so that people can get familiar with what the Arctic and the Antarctic look like. And bear in mind, these are just inflatable balls, you know, like they're not being super accurate here, but some are not far. So that means the ball gets passed around. Ah. Okay, what have you come up with? Uh, yes. Ah, great. So we're having questions and methods. So the question would be um, investigating diseases and immunity, potential lack of immunity in, in people, in, the, in people. And the method for investigating that? 
Taking, yeah, that's a good point. Taking air samples, taking ocean samples, also taking samples from the animals and taking samples from people. There's a huge study going on into human and animal health in the Arctic. And, and it's, it's massive. And if you want to talk about interdisciplinary science, this is a really key example because you've got atmospheric scientists looking at the air, you've got the oceanographers, you've got the health scientists, you've got social scientists. And a lot of this research is being being led by people who live in the Arctic and they're also talking to their grandparents and their great-grandparents to, to get to using oral history and, and social science methods. Yes? Okay, so how, how recent weather uh, has a, is affecting how they live? And the method was, was interviews and oral history and living with them. Yeah, living in the community. And we're saying living with them just because, actually, can I just ask, does anyone in this room live in the Arctic? Uh, you might laugh, but, you know, there's actually lots and lots of people who do live in the Arctic. Okay, we're using this term then, but, you know, everyone is similar, right? You know, so actually a lot of this... A lot, of these, a lot of the people running these research pr projects come from these communities, and so they're saying, I'm interviewing my community, I'm interviewing my friends and my family. It's not a, a sort of external study. Um, yes? That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Looking into uh, investigating or studying customs of the culture because customs often develop due to the physical environments, right? That's 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 a really great one, and it's true. And there's also, you know, there's a there's a study happening. That there's a lot of reindeer herding studies happening in IPY, but a lot, most of them are, don't actually have anything to do with reindeer. They just use the reindeer herding as a as a as a form of study. In that, um, there's a, I know somebody who's studying language and how language is changing because it's one of the few sort of nomadic groups left. And, you know, all the way around the Arctic, they can communicate, but they, they have subtly different languages and, and how globalization is affecting that as well. Um, lots, of, lots of hands on this side. What were you guys doing over here? Did you all have the globes upside down? You were looking at Antarctica? The, yes. Ah, that's a great question. How do people get all the nutrients they need only by eating meat? So this would be a study into, into food and health again. Uh, from my, I, I'm not an expert in this area at all. I think a lot of energy comes from, from the fat in the, in the animals which they hunt, but also, I mean, I can speak from my personal experience. I guess you guys might be able to from the Antarctic as well. You know, when you're living in a really cold environment, I mean, I didn't eat fruit and veg for a year, um, I just wanted to eat lard most of the time, to be honest. I had large amounts of, of cake, but that's just me. But, you know, but your, your dietary needs also vary according to your environmental, you know, where, where you live and what, what your environment is. How, how the diet is changing with climate change. These are some good questions here. Um, at the back... Excellent. Have you been reading that book? <laughs> yeah, that's a good. Social psychology. There's actually a lot of illnesses which, which seem to have come from um, sort of the, the southern part of the globe and, and how is that affecting communities in the Arctic. Okay, I'm going to take one more. We haven't had anyone from this side. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think if that would be a research question. Perhaps research, knowledge, and response. Um, but like I said, a lot of the research is actually coming from people who do live in the Arctic and are concerned. I would actually say, from just personal experience, that I think people who live in the Arctic are more concerned about climate change than people who don't live in the Arctic because they're seeing it happening every day around them. So I don't think it's a question of, of us having to inform them. I think it's them informing us and saying, look, this is, you know, this is happening. This is happening in my day-to-day -day life, and it's coming your way. So uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. Sorry, well, you, guys, you guys have done a great job. I realized you're writing it. I came up with a few, and I think you've touched on a lot of them. Health, contamination, that's like pollutants, climate change effects, local culture, economics. This is touching on the idea that, you know, some great big oil tycoons are coming their way. And, and, and the 
economic situation up there is going to change and politics. Permafrost. No one mentioned permafrost. Remember that from yesterday, the frozen soil? A huge amount of the Arctic is permafrost. A lot of people live on permafrost land. And if that melts, then their houses start falling over. That's a big question. There's an enormous amount of research going into permafrost. Food sources, that was also touched on. And survival, that was touched on. You did excellent. Brilliant. So these are the, these are the big questions that are being asked in terms of um, social science and also interdisciplinary science focused on the Arctic. So we're kind of looking now at science in terms of, in a sort of more interdisciplinary way than we did yesterday. There's a question. Okay, the, the Arctic isn't just ice, actually. The question was the Arctic is just ice. The Arctic is the area. It's defined in different ways. Some people define it as the area above which permafrost remains frozen. Some people define it as... The, it's actually often defined in terms of, scientifically in terms of permafrost. Other people define it in terms of culture and accessibility. Um, the Arctic Ocean is ice. But actually, there's an awful lot of land around the Arctic, and that's where people live, and a lot of communities live there. People don't live on the ice. No, people don't live on the ice. You see that comfort zone thing? That just happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with that one, though. People live on the land. They might live on the ice that's above the land, or on the ice that's flown off the land, but there's not really communities living on icebergs in the Arctic Ocean. It's, I'm talking about land-based Arctic here. This is, you've, one, of, one of your lecturers later in the week has just walked in, and I'm just going to warn him, they've been encouraged to push their lecturers outside their comfort zone. So flag that one. Okay. So, whoa, back to the chart. Yay! <laughs> I've never, ever, ever had an audience who enjoys the chart. You guys, you guys are great yesterday. They were asking questions about this. It's great. Okay, so just to kind of bring you back to what this, we started today looking at sea ice from space. We then looked at some ranger fur monitoring, so that's reindeer and caribou. Human health issues, environmental impacts, oil investigations. Oh, that was all the Arctic stuff. And then yesterday we looked at some ice core science, and you're going to hear much more about ice cores on Thursday from Mark Curran, who's sitting in the room. And then I just, I said to you yesterday, I said I'd just, you know, jump around the chart a bit. And since none of you actually did give me a, def, a bit of paper saying exactly what, what you wanted to see, I just thought I'd pick a few that had come up in conversation of a couple of other projects. I thought I'd touch on one of the marine projects, just because we haven't done much marine in the Arctic, and uh, this sort of supports some of the questions that Victoria was discussing earlier. And then there was also a lot of talk yesterday about how Antarctica had moved, and, and you know, when the dinosaurs lived there, and the fossils, so I thought I might show you something on that. And then for the astronomers in the room, and this is way outside of my comfort zone, I'd, I thought I'd mention that, that uh, astronomy experiment in the hope that there would be some physicists in the room who could back me up. And then, you know, we haven't talked much about the right-hand side of the chart. Every single, which is called education and outreach, every single project in this chart has made a commitment to education and outreach because there's a very strong belief that, you know, we could slog our hearts out working on this science and come back and really understand the Earth system really well. But if the rest of the, the world who we live and work with, the public, don't, aren't interested or don't understand what we're coming back and saying and discovering, then sometimes people like me come back and feel a little bit deflated. And, and actually, it's a really great thing to talk to people about what do you do and why do you do it. And, and it's, it's, it's the sort of communication. But I thought the one thing I just thought I might mention to you is the, the youth committee, the IPY youth committee, who, because IPY, when it was established by the great and the good, said they wanted to invest in the next generation of scientists. And, uh, and everyone said, oh, that's a very good idea. And they all patted themselves on the back and then went away and developed their science projects. And, and a, whole, a whole bunch of, of young people from various countries started scratching their heads and said, well, what exactly are you doing for us? And they said, oh, well, we're doing stuff and it's very good. And they said, well, what are you doing? So they actually put together a proposal, a very impressive proposal, to make sure that youth and young people and young scientists and aspiring scientists are front and center in IPY, get opportunities, get involved, get to learn about the polar regions, 
and get supported so that they can become the next great leading polar scientists for the next generation. So there's a lot of activity out there you may or may not be interested in. Okay, let's jump around the chart. The reason why I'm showing you this one is because somebody yesterday asked Victoria, how do you measure stuff on the bottom of the ocean floor? Do you remember that question? And, uh, and you know, one thing that you can do is instead of, go, instead of trawling or instead of putting out a catch, you can send out a, a vehicle. It's either remotely operated or autonomous, and it, you throw it over the side of the ship. <laughs> I know you're going to correct me when I'm wrong here, but off it goes, and it takes photos, takes samples. And there's a friend of mine went on a ship recently, and she came back with this piece of video from the bottom of the ocean floor. No, wait, 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 wait. Yay! Did you see that? It's cool. I love this bit. Is he going to do it again? Do you want to see that again? <laughs> okay, so this is like some kind of sea spider, but it isn't because it's not got the right number of legs because my dad counted it. What is it? Is it a sea spider? I've been calling it a sea spider. Look, it's just great. And there's a bit of fluff that comes by in a minute in the top right there. You see that? It gives you like a size idea. So it's not very big. I just think that's magic. And then look at this one. So this is, this is, this is video footage that has been recorded underwater, you know? And you wouldn't have ever been able to trawl and catch that and bring it to the top. By the time it came to the surface, it just would have been goo, you know? You know the pressure difference to go from the bottom to the top? But we can really learn amazing things about what's going on in the ocean now in these non-invasive methods. Isn't that cool? It's like a little weevil thing. And I, the person who gave me this video said they'd never seen this species before. I don't know if that, is that true? Do you know what it is? No, no okay. But they said they'd never seen this species before. Not only is it a new species found for science, but also you get to study, learn amazing things about how it moves and how it swims. Again, you wouldn't be able to have done that 25 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago even. Oh, you missed the videos there, Chris. Oh, worse luck. Okay. <laughs> Another thing which is, I just think is kind of cool is, is seal, see, you, know, you know, I always thought my friends who are seal scientists, I thought that, shh, I thought my friends who are seal scientists studied seals. But it turns out that seals are being used to do an amazing amount of oceanography. And it's not cruel. These things, the seal molt, molts, molts, I can't say that word, once a year. And this sensor just falls off at the end of the year. It doesn't hurt them. It's just put on with a bit of glue. And anyway, these, you know, seals swim around. <laughs> seals swim around in the Southern Ocean. Seals swim around in the Southern Ocean at times all year round, right? At times when scientists can't get there. So we, as scientists, go on ships and we can only actually study the ocean on that particular day or that particular week that we're there. And it's very expensive to do that. And so what these oceanographers have done is they've, they've said, oh, they've turned to their seal scientist friends and they've said, can we use your seals? This is, a, this is data from one seal dive. This is one seal. And actually, I need to stand over here for this. Uh, so what you've got here is depth down to 1,000 meters and time. And what you can see there is how the seal, each one of those things is a seal dive, and it's taking temperature data. So you can see how the, temp how the seal has dived over these four months. But more importantly, for the oceanographers, you can also get a, a snapshot of the ocean temperature at that time of year. And if you put lots of these together, this, that was temperature. This one's salinity. This is data from over 3,000 dives. And you can see this line here is the coastline of South Georgia, which is an island in the sub-Antarctic. And you can see the seals going off and diving. And you see the red and the blue and the green. That's different salinity. And, and this is a really amazing way of learning about how the ocean composition varies and is structured at times of year that we physically can't get there. So it's just kind of an interesting application. And I, gave this to, I showed this slide to... Um, to a room full of, of meteorologists. I don't really know why I was showing them seals. I just kind of thought they might find it interesting. And the guy at the end stood up and he said, does that mean we could put something on the head of an albatross? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that. But you know, it's this idea of interdisciplinary science, of, of talking to what, what your colleagues are doing and seeing how it might be interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, then, then you, yeah, you, the wind would drop, wouldn't it? Yeah. We had talked about albatross by, by catch yesterday. I've got to say, a lot of my friends are really involved very much in, in the sort of Save the Albatross campaign, and it is a really 
it is a really sad thing and it's a really big deal and there's a lot of work and there's a lot of campaigns and if it's something that did upset you or which you'd like to learn more about there's an awful lot of information on the web look up Save the Albatross and, um, and you can, really can get involved with that campaign so there, are, there is stuff you can do you can campaign, you can shout, you can tell people about it and already an awful lot of awareness has been raised on this issue because there are ways that you can there are things you can do to the fishing lines there are ways that you can change how you fish so that the Albatross don't die so, you know, if, if over the next couple of weeks, you know, this is eco-science. We are talking to you. We are telling you what we know, as we know it, as scientists. We don't necessarily have answers to everything, but there, or anything, <laughs> very much. But there are definitely ways you can get involved. So don't just let stuff go past you. Say, right, I want to know more about that. This is because we talked a lot yesterday about Antarctica. And I think I told you that I would show you the two different plates. Remember we mentioned somebody said it's a one continental plate, and I said... It's not. I'm going to... Did you see that? That was how... I might, should I go back? I'll just show you that one again. Now you know what's coming. Okay. So this was over 100 million years, how the, how the countries ended up where they are. Now, look there. Did you see that gate between Patagonia and Antarctica just broke up? And you've got these two plates, West Antarctic and East Antarctic. So... I'm really glad Victoria's in the room because we were talking about when the gateways opened and um, the formation of the circumpolar current. And I'm, I'm hoping, and I'm not sure, like I said, Victoria and I never met until yesterday. We were talking about the fish and they, they got, somebody said, well, why did some fish end up not adapting and some ended up adapting? And you said something had happened, right? And I think this is what happened. Okay, good. I'm glad that's right. So what happened is those plates moved and that current, that's the first time we had a, a complete ocean circulation system going around a continent, around the world, and that actually, I mean, it's fundamental to driving the ocean circulation system, which we've also talked about. But also, I thought it was really interesting, you know, it, it had a big effect on fish adaptation. It has had a big effect on a lot of things. And there's a, a huge study called Plates and Gates, which is going down to this gateway area to drill below the ocean to take deep ocean sediment cores and, and this, this, this mud basically gives you information from millions of years ago. Those ice core data I showed you yesterday, that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. So this stuff goes back millions of years to try and find out what the world was like when it was a warmer world. What, what, you know, what actually happened to, to look at how those rocks changed. So this is geology. This is, this is uh, I, the point being that you know, I don't, all of you have got a really wide variety of interests in science and that there's something going on for everyone here. So the final one, which I uh, said I'd show you with some unease, <laughs> was this ice cube experiment that I mentioned yesterday. And there's a lot of information about this on the web. It's a great project. As I told you, I'm not an astronomer. My understanding of this... Okay, this, this thing on the left shows you a schematic. That's over two kilometers of ice below South Pole Station. That's a long way, right? And they've... they've drilled these holes and they've put optical fibers. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. This is my, like, as you can tell, comfort zone outside. They've drilled these, these holes and, and put optical fibers down, loads and loads and loads and loads of holes, really deep. And each one of them is connected to the top. And, and because it's, it's, I mean, it's ice, it's really cold, it's really stable. There's very little background um, interference. It's a phenomenal place to study cosmic stuff. This is the <laughs> comfort zone. This is, this is looking at neutrinos. And it's looking at neutrinos that have come... This just boggles my mind. It, it's looking at neutrinos that have come through the Earth. I always thought telescopes pointed that way. But this is, this is catching neutrinos which are just flying through us the whole time, which have come through the Earth. And on, on, on the off chance that one of them hits one of these optical fibers, it then sends a signal up two kilometers of ice and off and actually there's a little animation on the web, you guys should look it up, where the neutrino comes up through the earth and it hits an optical fiber and then, and then the signal goes up the optical fiber through the ice and it reaches the top to the South Pole Station. Then there's this picture of this scientist jumping up and down. <laughs> I found one, but they have got a signal. Would one of you like to expand on this project? Because I guess you know more about it than I do. Neutrinos travel up further through material than the other
So I don't know how many of you heard that. So the Earth is actually being used as a, as a kind of big optical block, right, to kind of slow them down, catch them, figure out where they're coming from. Ah, okay. Catches all the stuff that isn't from a long way away. That came from his, his, these are his words. See, it's not just me who doesn't use the long words. If you want to know more, you're in a physics department. You're surrounded by astronomers. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left. We've got going, going back to this, you saw this yesterday. What do I know? What do I want to learn? Think about, think about where you're at. I'd just be really interested. Can I have a couple of scribes again, please? Where are you? Oh, you're over there. Just, you know, we're coming to the end of this session. You're going to hear a lot more about polar science for the rest of the couple of weeks. I've come up with four key messages in IPY that, for me, I think are the four main things I'd like to bring across if ever I talk. If you were to go out and talk to people after the ISS, talk to your friends, talk to your family, and they say, why are the polar regions important? Why, why, would, why would all these people come and talk to you for two weeks about the polar regions? What, what could you tell them? Anyone? Cutting edge scientific research. That's a good one. The note either of you can write. It's just, okay, the question is, you know, what, what are the reasons, why are the polar regions important? Why would people come and talk to you about it? Um, I'm going to take, just keep moving this way. Yes. Uh, key indicators of global warming. Key indicators of global warming. What you guys might just want to do is alternate. So you write one, you write one. Okay, this block, yes. Just simply because there's so much that's undiscovered. <coughs> Undiscovered science. Anyone in this block? Yes. Large effects on climate. Large effects on climate. Yes. In fact, you know, to a large degree determines, like the ocean circulation system, the circumpolar current. Yeah. Um, yes. It's affected. Yeah. So there's a large effect on climate. The second one was, it's having, it's being affected by climate change. Yeah, it's actually these are two key areas at the back. Background signal, good indication of the condition of the world. That's a really good point. You know, as an atmospheric chemist, you, I, you know, you're never going to get cleaner air than you do in the Antarctic. You've spoken a lot. I'll come back to you. I've seen one up here. Yes, was there a hand back there? Oh, there wasn't. Oh, you get your chance. Unique ecosystems. Are there any other ones? Oh, yeah. Yeah, unique biodiversity. That can go with the ecosystems, I think. At the back here. I like it because people live there and it's changing. Okay, I'll take two more. Resources for potential exploitation. Yeah, why, 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 the question was why do we research it? Because it's so different from everywhere else. I think that's a very good thing to say because it's, because you know, we can really understand the Earth system because you've got to understand all aspects of it. Uh, in a minute, hang on. In terms of the fact that it's mainly climate, it's mainly climate that melts, so if there are temperature rises, there are changes, what are some made of ice and it can melt. Yeah, that's, I think that can go in on, a, can be affected by climate change, but that's good. Okay, I know I said I'd take two, but all the hands then started popping up. So one, two, and, and then I, okay. Yeah, uh, indicate, I think that was also, we've also kind of had that one. Um, but did somebody get that? It's, it's not been influenced by human activities. It's a good background signal. Okay, there was one more here, yes? Drives the ocean currents. Yeah, I mean, I think you've got, so you've got drives. So I think we're coming up with similar things now. Drives ocean currents. You know, it's very, but also it's a very unique place to do science. Like you couldn't do the Neutrino Laboratory anywhere else. Gosh, just okay. Yes, <laughs> great. Ah, it's frozen the evidence of our past. That's a great one. See, it's good. I have to keep taking them because you're coming up with new ones. That's great. Was there another one up in the front row here? The same thing. Okay, great. Yes? Potential pharmacological derivatives from the unusual adaptations, such as the antifreeze compound. 
Oh, someone was paying attention this morning. That's good. Potential. For, could you get that? I can't even use those words. <laughs> Is that Latin? Potential pharmacological uh, applications. applications. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> Great. Well, that's good. So these are the four that I came up with. Shrinking ice and snow. The, the polar regions are changing. Neighbors in the north, people live there. Global local linkages, the ho it's all related. Anything we do here, anything that happens in the polar regions. And new frontiers of science, vantage point for new science. I think, I'm not sure, but I hope that most of these things that you came up with can fit within at least one of these. If the polar regions interest you, if you're interested in this stuff, there's an awful lot of, of polar activity, of science, of research, of opportunities for students happening over the next two years. Now is a really, really great time to get involved. 50 years ago was the, the last IGY, and you, we saw a massive increase in scientists interested in the Earth system who, who were fostered, who were developed, you know, had amazing opportunities during that IGY. The same thing is happening during this IPY. And if ever there was an age and a time to be interested in polar science, right now I would say you guys are the key people to grab this opportunity. So, I just was going to leave you with various things if you're interested. Oops, we're jumping ahead. There, as I mentioned, there is the Youth Steering Committee and the, it's a very active group of people who, who are always looking for they can never have an, enough time or energy and they go out and talk to schools and get involved and put on big conferences. Look out for student opportunities. There are opportunities to go to the polar regions. There are opportunities to go to conferences on polar science. Talk to the, get, follow IPY, follow the IPY youth. The, the youth steering committee themselves are planning to put on an enormous conference in 2009 in Canada that should be international and should have funding for travel. Um, because they've said, we want a conference for people of our own age. We want to put it on and we want to discuss and be the presenters and be the people involved. So if that's something you're interested in, get involved with the IPY Youth. Tell them you'd like to help out or you'd like to go. Become a polar ambassador. Learn about the polar regions. All the presentations, which you're going to see over the next two weeks, are going to be made available to you along with the eco-science book. You know more than most teachers on all of this stuff. If you want to go out and talk to people about it, if you want, you know, whatever you want to do, you have the facilities, you have the resources, you have the support behind you. They are really a, an amazing place. So at that point, I think I'm going to end and take questions. <laughs>